thank you so much for taking the time today to be with us to join the conversation about the situation at our southern border and how CBT is responding. My name is Laura Kuhlman and I will be your moderator tonight. And now I'll turn things over to Pete Dros, Director of External Relations, to get us started. Hello everyone, I'm Pete Dros. For three and a half years, the Trump administration has carried out an assault on refugees and asylum seekers. They bumbled for a while at the beginning, but Stephen Miller and his allies have now figured out how to pull the levers of power to make policy changes at the executive level that can't easily be overturned by the Congress. We're talking about some of the world's most vulnerable people. President Trump has dropped the number of refugees allowed to resettle in this country from 110,000 in 2016 to just 15,000 this year, and they'll resettle far fewer than that. He's implemented a malicious remain in Mexico policy for people seeking asylum at our southern border. And he's unleashed many other cruel policies, which my colleague will describe uh, in just a moment. You're all here tonight because you are horrified at the just lack of dignity, compassion, and respect and the outright contempt that this administration has for refugees, asylum seekers, and in fact, immigrants of all kinds. So thank you for being here. Let me also say that CBT has a very strong interest in asylum policy because first, there's a staggering number of torture survivors among the asylum seeking population, perhaps the same percentage as the refugee population at about 44%. And second, so many of our clients and clients at other torture survivor centers across the United States are asylum seekers and attacks on the asylum system generate anxiety, fear, and depression among those clients. It's never been good for asylum seekers and it's never been as bad for asylum seekers as it's been in the past three and a half years. Under international law, states have the right to control their borders and determine who's allowed to enter. At the same time, it's also the case that people fleeing persecution or fear of persecution have a legal right to seek asylum. Our advocacy on asylum-related issues aims to protect and support that right. Tonight, you'll hear about an assessment we completed at several southern border cities, our observations from those visits, and next steps for responding to this crisis. You might hear some things that are really difficult to take in. This is an important witnessing we're doing right now, and we know that with your help, there are ways we can begin to alleviate suffering for the survivors you'll hear about tonight. To start by giving you some policy background, I'll turn it over to Andrea. Thank you, Pete, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm Andrea Carcamo, Senior Policy Counsel, and I'm joining you tonight, joining here tonight from Washington, D.C., where CBT has our policy advocacy office. And I was one of the uh, CBT folks who had the privilege of being part of our border initiative, uh, which means that I went to the border and saw firsthand what the Trump administration is doing and has been doing um, to asylum seekers during the last three days. Uh, th Sorry, three years. Hopefully it would be three days, right? Um, something that really stood out to me and that stuck was a statement by one of the service providers. And what she said was that there has always been deterrence at the border, but now this administration has added cruelty to it. And part of this cruelty includes the different implementation of these policies along the border to the point that those trying to help asylum seekers don't really know what to do to actually help, um, and they're confused. Um, first, to help you understand a little bit what's been happening at the southern border, I'm going to give a brief overview <clears throat> of the various policies uh, that the Trump administration has been implementing in the last three years uh, there. Uh, but please keep in mind that all of these policies at the moment are not really taking place right now because there's another policy um, that has pretty much shut off asylum for anyone uh, that's been in po um, practice because of COVID-19. Um, so I'll, um, I'll go ahead and tell you about those policies. The first one is metering. 
And this policy limits the number of individuals who can ask for asylum on any given day, uh, which creates a waiting list. Now, the administration of the waiting list is implemented with a complete lack of transparency and inconsistency across the border. That's one of the points where inconsistency is seen. The next one is MPP, which stands for Migration Protection Protocols, or it's also known as Remain in Mexico, and which Pete also mentioned earlier. Uh, this policy instructs Border Patrol to send asylum seekers back to Mexico to wait while they go through their asylum process, uh, which honestly takes months and even years. And to put it in context, before MPP, and all of the other policies that I'm going to talk about, um, asylum seekers were often released into the U.S. to reunite with family members and go through the immigration process while they were with them, uh, which really helped them to begin the healing process, um, with both mental and physical. Um, now, <laughs> asylum seekers are left vulnerable in extremely dangerous Mexican border towns and they suffer in having to spend time in CBP custody every time they have to go to their immigration hearing. Uh, the point of how brutal this is, um, is seen by the fact that a lot of asylum seekers choose to abandon their claim because they just don't wanna go through CBP custody again. The next one is the asylum transit ban. And this policy bars from asylum anyone who crosses through a third country before arriving in the US. Since these individuals are arriving through the southern border, which is, um, I mean, we're going to, with Mexico, practically anyone but Mexicans um, is banned from asylum uh, because of this. Uh, now, they can still apply for other forms of relief, but they don't really include things like the ability to apply um, to include family members, or if they don't create a path to citizenship. The next ones, um, one is PACER and HARP. I know a lot of acronyms. Um, PACER stands for Prompt Asylum Review Process, and HARP um, is a Humanitarian Asylum Review Process, and they're practically the same. And let's be honest, uh, what these acronyms stand for doesn't really matter because they're often really a, a nice sounding name for something that is terribly harsh to immigrants. Um, well, the policies. <laughs> they speed up the, the, the first step of the asylum process to remove asylum seekers within 10 days while they are in CDP custody. They would normally be in ICE custody in these conditions, um, which makes it, uh, and it's very, very damaging to them that they're in in ICE custody, since CBP custody was made only for someone to spend 72 hours, and that's according to our government. A lot of advocates and ourselves don't think that people should spend more than a few hours in CBP custody. So again, they're spending 10 days in CBP custody with little access to attorneys or any other type of help in their case. Um, the last but not least uh, policy that I will discuss here is the, well, are they asylum cooperative, cooperative agreements? Um, they're also known as ACAs. And what they do is allow the removal of asylum seekers to Honduras and Guatemala and eventually to El Salvador to allegedly <laughs> allow them uh, to seek asylum there. Uh, but honestly, it's simply absurd. We know these countries aren't safe, um, given that a good number of those seeking asylum are from these countries. Um, well, in the end, to summarize, uh, pretty much what these policies altogether do is block access to asylum and re-traumatize individuals who are just trying to escape horrendous experiences. Um, and now I will turn it over to um, the able hands of Ermi to talk about our, our assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ermi Shukla, and I am a program evaluation advisor on CBT's research team. So as Pete and Andrea have illustrated, we needed to take concrete steps to see how CBT could help those on the border. So our first step was to conduct an assessment of the situation on the border. 
So this is an important first step that gives us vital information on how to design and implement a new program. It allows us to speak with individuals on the ground, going beyond what we can learn from already um, available secondary sources. For CBT's assessments, we go into communities that we think might benefit from CBT's services, and then we have a series of in-depth discussions about the situation on the ground and how CBT could potentially help those affected by trauma. So in the case of the southern border, we are learning about how CBT can work with those that have been subject to trauma at many points on their journey to the U.S., including in their home countries, on the journey itself, on the U.S.-Mexico border while they're waiting, and also while detained um, in U.S. government custody. For this assessment, we assembled an interdisciplinary team of CBT staff from research, policy, clinical services, as well as organizational development. Um, so all of our meetings were conducted in either English or Spanish, depending on the preference of the stakeholder. And all of our team members, except one, um, is fluent in Spanish. And we also have one team member who is from Mexico and is currently based in Mexico City. Okay, so on this map, you'll see the border locations that we visited over the course of our assessment. Um, and these are the ones that are circled in red. So these include the San Diego Tijuana border crossing, um, which is currently the busiest land border crossing in the United States. Um, the town of Mexicali, uh, which is the capital of the state of Baja California in Mexico, and is right across the border from Calexico in Eastern California. Um, we also visited Tucson and Nogales in Arizona, along with Nogales on the Mexico side, um, which is located in the state of Sonora. And the last place we visited in person was El Paso, Texas and Ciudad Juarez. The team did have plans to make in-person visits to the Rio Grande Valley in East Texas, but needed to change plans due to the COVID-19 travel restrictions. We were, however, able to complete um, the Rio Grande Valley portion of the assessment virtually um, through meetings with individuals that work in the region, specifically in Laredo and Nuevo Laredo, McAllen and Reynosa, and Brownsville and Matamoros. So uh, one thing we did see was a lot of heterogeneity in the resources available for asylum seekers along the border, as well as harsher conditions. Um, in general, there was a progressive decrease in resources as we went further east along the border. So what did we do during these assessments? Um, so we conducted in-depth meetings with those working on the front lines of the border crisis. So this included immigration attorneys, shelter staff, universities, nonprofit advocacy organizations, and health service providers. So we asked specifically um, about their work, um, including the needs of asylum seekers along the border, and their own personal challenges in doing this work, which has become harder due to the Trump administration's policies. We went in to explore three potential avenues for CBT to provide services, which my colleagues will go into more detail um, later on in this presentation. But broadly, we were looking at the mental health needs of asylum seekers, the mental health needs of frontline workers on the border, and the potential to use psychological evaluations to support asylum cases. In addition, we looked at other key factors, um, including the potential for partnerships with other organizations, the profile of migrants who are affected by the crisis, and potential security concerns at each border location. Okay. So members of the assessment team will share some of our observations um, next, but I wanted to first share a few general interesting findings from our assessment that will help give an overall picture of the situation on the border. So one um, interesting finding is that while the majority of asylum seekers uh, do come from Northern Central America, which includes Honduras, uh, Guatemala, and El Salvador, um, and these are specifically referring to asylum seekers that are under either the metering or the um, remain in Mexico policy. There, we've also seen individuals from Cuba, Haiti, um, English speaking Cameroon and Brazil um, that often have different profiles than those from Central America. 
Um, we also found reports that only about one to three percent of asylum seekers in Mexico under the Remain in Mexico policy have any sort of legal representation, um, which is abysmally low. And we also had many reports that the threat of trauma within border towns was very palpable. So we have reports from medical service providers that between 30 and 80 percent of migrants seeking medical services have experienced some form of trauma. Um, and these include um, incidents such as kidnapping, sexual violence, and other forms of physical violence. Um, so the estimate tends to be higher further east in Nuevo Laredo um, with a medical service provider citing that around 80% of the migrants that seek medical services have experienced some form of trauma. And now uh, my colleagues, Ali and Leora, will give us an overview of some of our observations on the border. Thanks, Ermi. Hello, everybody. Good evening. My name is Ali Beckman, and I am Senior Clinician for External Relations at CVT. Not to be confused with CBP. I saw some chat about that. CVT, of course, is the Center for Victims of Torture. And when we say CBP, we mean Customs and Border Patrol. Um, we'll try to make that distinction more clear. Maybe just say Border Patrol. So I want to start the sharing of our firsthand observations by reminding us that the media images and the messages we receive about the border paint a certain picture that isn't entirely accurate. Historically, these border communities have been alive and vibrant for many years. People from these towns may view themselves as part of one large community instead of being from one of two towns. Something you'll hear often on the border is, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. Hi everyone, I'm Leora Hudak, a mental health and psychosocial support consultant at CDT. Uh, one of the most striking stories I heard during our assessment happened at a shelter in Tucson. Uh, an asylum seeker who was stuck in Mexico because of Trump's Remain in Mexico policy, or MPP, was kidnapped and tortured. Uh, when she finally was released into the United States, she was badly hurt, and it was the Border Patrol officer who was responsible for bringing her in his arms to the shelter. The shelter staff received her and provided medical care, and both the Border Patrol officer and the shelter staff were in tears, sharing the weight of that situation. Hearing the story during assessment made me feel more compassionate for Border Patrol officers and really helped me to understand that these are communities of neighbors, relatives, and friends confronting top-down systems and policies that are harming asylum seekers and the individuals who work with them. It also helped me to understand just how much trauma border communities are holding. One of the stories that really stuck with me was one uh, of a woman who arrived to look for services with a broken arm. And the reason why her arm was broken was because she was fighting so hard to keep her child while someone else was trying to kidnap the child. And I mean, we hear, about how vulnerable people are in these border towns, but we have to listen to individual stories and aggregate them to really grasp the, grasp the degree of terror that they are truly experiencing. So we also saw the continued use of family separation, um, even though the official policy is no longer in place. Um, so we saw some family members going to U.S. detention while others were sent back to Mexico, particularly in cases where children were traveling with grandparents or other family members. And there were also cases of parents sending their children to the U.S. alone to be reunited with other family members. Um, since unaccompanied minors are exempt from going back to Mexico under the Remain in Mexico policy. So many parents um, on the border saw this as the only option to keep their children out of danger. And the, care, the terrible conditions aren't just on the Mexico side. Um, like Andrea was talking about before, asylum seekers who are in, who are waiting in Mexico because of this MPP or remain in Mexico policy, what they have to do is they have to cross into the United States each time they have an immigration hearing, and there are a series of them. When this happens, they have to pass through Border Patrol, um, their detention centers. And these places are horrible, super cold holding cells, holding cells that have been come to, 
be called the hileras or the ice boxes. So Border Patrol was meant to hold these folks for just a few hours, like Andrea said. It was never their job to run detention centers. But now people are being held in them for several days, up to 10 days, again, like Andrea said, as they wait for court. So because of these aleras, asylum seekers are getting pneumonia and other illnesses. Some people are choosing to drop their asylum case altogether rather than face the aleras again. Some clients we serve domestically um, in Minnesota have talked about their time in the alera as one of the worst parts of their trauma experience, including their actual torture. I think it's really easy to feel like what's happening at the border is completely overwhelming. We've just presented you with a lot of stories and observations that um, really show the gravity of what's happening down at the border. But visiting border cities, you see longstanding and dedicated communities of advocates and providers and a considerable capacity for change. So now Ali and I will share a little bit with you about what we learned about what CBT might be able to do to provide needed support along the border. Uh, the assessment largely confirmed what we expected the need to be. There's a need in three primary areas, mental health care for asylum seekers, support services uh, for providers that are working along the border, and psychological evaluations to support asylum claims, particularly for folks who are in the Remain in Mexico uh, program. So first I'll tell you a little bit about our ideas for providing direct mental health care for asylum seekers. As you just heard, asylum seekers arriving at our border face multiple complex traumatic experiences in their home countries, on the journey through Mexico, while waiting in dangerous border cities, and then while moving through the US immigration system. Parents may make the long journey with their children or while separated from family. Based on what the assessment team learned, we're in the process of designing potential programs that respond to the borderlands, not simply as Mexico or the United States, but as a region inclusive of both countries and their policies and circumstances. We're considering how a program um, could have a cross-border approach to delivering mental health services, and we're also thinking about how a potential program would work in partnership with legal organizations, since the immigration process itself is a major factor impacting the asylum seekers' mental health. The type of mental health support we implement will be reflective of the needs of people in movement, including shorter term interventions for folks who stay just a short period of time to longer term multidisciplinary treatment for individuals who are waiting in Mexico for longer periods of time. Great. So thanks, Leora. That was recommendation number one. Our second recommendation is to provide secondary trauma and staff resilience support to service providers working on the border we observed was that people working at the border need more support than a one-time webinar can provide. One attorney we met with in Juarez said MPP, that's the Remain in Mexico policy, is killing us from the inside out. The extra work, the trauma stories they hear, the inconsistency in which immigration policies are implemented make it very difficult for people to do their work and it's our impression that this is intentional from the administration. And so, for example, in Tijuana, we met with a coalition of mental health professionals who met regularly to discuss the best practices in working with the migrant population on the Mexico side of the border. These folks are incredibly skilled in their profession, but because of the po policies that Andrea mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, they're being asked by migrants they work with to help them prepare psychological evaluations and documentation for their cases that are in the U.S. Immigration Court. They shared with us that they never really expected they would need to know the ins and outs of the U.S. immigration system to sufficiently serve their clients. And on top of that, they shared encountering a, a new and different types of clinical cases and reported a need for training and resources um, in serving torture survivors. And this is the type of training and capacity building um, that's an area where CBT has a considerable amount of expertise. Um, yes, our mission and our work at CBT has made us specialists in treating torture survivors. We can train others in this. We can provide resources, tools, and trainings on dealing with secondary trauma, and we can provide support in building up resiliency. Um, with the risk of making, myself, making ourselves not sound very humble, this is the work that we have become exceptionally experienced at in the 35 years of providing care to torture survivors. 
We are actually now receiving requests for these kinds of trainings from our partners in places we work all across the world as care providers struggle from the added challenges of providing care during COVID-19. And this is work we could actually do virtually so it doesn't have to wait for the pandemic to end. Okay, last recommendation, our third one, is to expand the availability of psychological evaluations for asylum seekers in that Remain in Mexico program. So folks who are on the Mexico side waiting for their chance to ask for asylum. In general, the rate at which asylum seekers win their cases is already super low. It's even lower if you don't have an attorney, which is the case for most asylum seekers in that Remain in Mexico program, like Ermi talked about. One thing that can help is a psychological evaluation for those individuals who have survived torture and trauma and who ha may have difficulty sharing their story in this linear narrative kind of way. A psychological evaluation describing the trauma and its impact on the survivor could, can put an asylum seeker's case and the facts into context. Only a very small percentage of asylum seekers have access to these kind of evaluations. We've been in touch with two organizations who have networks of mental health providers who serve as volunteer evaluators. These organizations only provide evaluations to asylum seekers who already have an attorney and mostly on the US side of the border. The reason for that is that there are many, many complications to providing psychological evaluations across borders and without the coordination of an attorney. We are in conversation with these organizations and a law firm who's supporting CBT pro bono to try to wade through all of these complications. What we do believe is that a coordinated effort to connect evaluators to asylum seekers who are in Mexico could really make an impact in getting vulnerable, asi vulnerable asylum seekers to safety. So hearing these stories from the border sits heavy with me every time. But it's incredibly heartening to be on this call with more than 100 people from around the country who want to do something to help. So what's next? First, we've already started development of a training and support project on secondary trauma, staff care, and self-care. As Ali has just been saying, it's even more urgent during COVID because of the greater deprivation and desperation that survivors are feeling and the helplessness of attorneys and humanitarian workers. We're currently seeking funding to implement, implement this program. It'll take $80,000 for us to design the materials, translate them, and provide the virtual training. Second, we know that any rehabilitative care program for survivors on the Mexico side isn't possible right now because the border's shut down, and it will be for quite some time. Still, we're working to develop the plans for the program and the type of care we'll provide so that when the border reopens, when we're able to travel again, and when funding is secured, we're ready to go. Finally, policy implications. We're currently working with our coalition partners to end the terrible policies that you've heard about tonight. And after conducting this assessment, we're developing a new and specific set of recommendations on creating a truly compassionate and trauma-informed approach to the nation's asylum system. Recommendations will include funding, for mental health and psychosocial support for asylum seekers and the attorneys and humanitarian workers who support them in the U.S. and Mexico. We'll keep you posted on this advocacy work and all we've talked about tonight. So thanks again for joining us and now we'll open it up to questions. Thanks, Pete. Okay, so wow, you guys have been sending amazing questions in and we're going to try to get to as many as we possibly can. So, um, Leora, this First question is going to you, and the question is, can mental health care really make an impact when the trauma is continuously present? And Margaret from New York had asked this question. Yes, thank you. This is a, this is a great question and one we get asked a lot at CVT. Um, and the short answer is um, there can't really be a focus on, on just one thing or another when we're thinking about the needs of asylum seekers. Um, we need both mental health care and the other types of social support and immigration support happening at the same time. Um, what mental health care does um, for folks who are living in conditions in, of continuous traumatic stress is it really puts the ground underneath people's feet. Um, working with a mental health professional, a social worker, or a therapist can really help folks develop the skills that they need to cope, to function, and to feel safe. 
in conditions where um, they're still confronting a lot of danger and uncertainty. So what we know from our clients in Minnesota um, is that you know, is that clients are more successful in their asylum claims when they have the support of a CBT therapist or social worker. Um, what we've come to know is that by, by going through their mental health treatment at the same time, that they are, they're developing all of these skills that they need. And a big part of the asylum process is the need to tell and retell the trauma story over and over again. So if we think about the context of the border, what is, what's happening is folks are arriving at the border, they're passing through um, Customs and Border Patrol, they're presenting before a judge, um, confronting a lot of things could be, that could be really reminiscent of their trauma experiences. And so with the support of a therapist, they're learning and developing the skills that they need to be able to move through and be successful in their claim. And the last thing I think that's important to mention is that what we know from talking to legal service providers is that when folks don't have a therapist or a social worker or somebody who's supporting them in their mental health, that these attorneys end up playing the role of the therapist or social worker concurrent to doing their role um, as an, as in the legal profession. So if CBT can really provide that care, um, then that can unburden the attorney from some of these additional roles and let them focus on the things that they do best. Thanks, Leora. Um, Andrea, I'm going to send the next question to you. This question comes from Lucy in Florida, but we've been hearing a lot of concern um, from people tonight about this. So um, what Lucy writes is a couple years back, Trump implemented family separation at the border as a deterrence policy. And I thought that policy had ended, but I heard you mentioned something about that um, during this presentation. And can you talk a little bit more about how family separation is still active, if it is at all right now? Um, yes, of course. Uh, so the actual, the family separation that took place uh, in 2018 was a little bit different from the family separation that is taking place right now. The type of family separation that we see right now at the border is mostly um, like something that I believe Leora uh, um, mentioned, is that parents are so desperate in getting protection for their children that they're sending them across the border by themselves uh, because that would make the children qualify as unaccompanied minors and that would give them special protections uh, that would not put them into MPP and other programs like that. Uh, the other type of family separation that we see is that when people are proce processed at the border, are often separated. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes if, if um, officers know that there's a, a, a husband and wife, they put one in MPP and not another. Um, and we've heard from partners that this has been done on purpose. Uh, the other type is that um, when people are, um, are, for example, come with a grandmother, uh, they're not allowed to remain together uh, because they're not seen as an as immediate family. Thanks, Andrea. Allie, this question is for you, and it um, comes from Fernando in Georgia. And he asks, what are the key elements of secondary trauma intervention or treatment? And what are the needs of those suffering secondary trauma, and how can they be helped? Great, thanks. Good question. So, so our plan, secondary trauma is a term that, you know, when we started 35 years ago was a really relatively new new term. And since then, there, there's been a proliferation of secondary trauma trainings. You can find a webinar pretty much anywhere that gets to how a person is impacted personally when you work with somebody who is a survivor of trauma. So what we want to do is we would want to plan uh, secondary trauma and resiliency supports that would be unique to the folks down at the border and that would actually go beyond sort of a secondary trauma 101. So a typical secondary trauma 101 training might remind you to do things like set your work hours and, and keep a strict boundary around them or take a yoga class to de-stress or eat and sleep well. And, and frankly, these kind of messages might not match the working conditions of the providers on the border. So much of their work includes emergencies that need responding to immediately, and that might happen um, after hours. And for a lot of people, their work is part of their identity and part of their personal mission, and they can't separate it from it. So our secondary trauma trainings, which we are developing now, 
would be much more focused on the tools to be as resilient as possible. So you're going to experience secondary trauma. You can't avoid it. The goal is to mitigate it and to be as resilient as you can. So we would do things like explore questions like, how do you view your role in this work? How do you not attach the outcome of what happens to your client to who you are as a person? So our secondary trauma support would, would really want to focus or be more directed at, at managing those kind of existential crises. I'll stop there. Thanks, Sally. Um, Ermi, we have a question for you, and this is coming from Alice in Minnesota. Um, she asks, are there any estimates of what percentage of migrants on the border have experiences that would fall under the definition of torture? That's a very good question. Um, so at the moment, we only have very, very rough estimates that are that come from medical service providers. Um, and it's important to note that these numbers are limited to the percentage of migrants that are actively seeking medical care, so that actively go to a medical service provider. Um, so we have varying numbers for that, and we have anecdotal information that there is a very, very high need for mental health services among asylum seekers on the border, and that there have been reports of, of torture. But actually, one of the things that we would like to do moving forward, and one of our other recommendations is to complete a representative survey, um, potentially supplemented with in-depth interviews with asylum seekers, so we can actually get a better picture of the magnitude of need um, on the border. So one of the challenges is that there currently has not been any sort of representative survey completed on the border. Um, due to a wide variety of challenges, and that is one of the recommendations that we are also considering. Thank you. Andrea, question for you here, and this comes from Anne, but we've also heard from several people who are wondering, um, have a similar question, and that question is, will all of these recommendations that you have put forth make a difference if um, Trump loses his re loses re-election and his policies are lifted? So the big question is, what will happen if there is a presidential change or if there is not? Okay, the question of the hour. Um, well, there will be a lot of changes. Um, if there's a change of leadership, it would be Biden. <laughs> and he has already said that he will get rid of most of these policies within the first 100 days of his presidency. Uh, so yes, a lot of changes. Uh, but we don't really know what that process is going to look like. And we don't know how long it will take to clear the border or whether there might be a new wave of migrants. Um, but we are working with our advocacy partners to create a plan on how a new government could uh, direct, direct this transition. Um, regardless though, there would still be a role for CBT. Uh, as many of the folks uh, will need additional mental health support due to, due to the added trauma uh, caused by all of these policies that we've been talking about. Wonderful. So, Leora, I'm going to come to you now. And speaking of all these policies, Hazel has a question. Um, she says, it seems like there are mo more folks at the border struggling from trauma than before and um, is wondering if it's because of all of these policies. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question. And I think it's, you know, it's hard to say. I, what I, one thing I think is really important to note is that there's always been a population of folks at the border. There's always been a population of folks seeking asylum. Um, and there's always been a great deal of that percentage of that population that has um, had traumatic uh, experiences or has a trauma history. And so that part isn't necessarily new. And I think the folks that we met along the border would definitely speak to that. Like the things that have happened over the course of the last few years have intensified and amplified the situation. Um, but some of the things that they're seeing are things that have been there for a very long time. Um, so with that said, though, I think the thing that has changed is this addi additional piece that we talked about. So often um, we describe our work in terms of these different types of traumas that folks experience throughout the course of their, their lives. So there's the, the trauma that happens in the home country, that that happens along the journey, um, and the trauma that happens kind of ongoing and continuous throughout the course of resettlement, which is inclusive of the asylum process. I think the part that's really new um, um, or has changed a little bit is um, are some of the trauma tra traumatic experiences that folks are that folks are going through as they move through the U 
US asylum system. And I think that's something that's really difficult for us to contend with is that, you know, it's our policies, our approach to folks who are, are arriving and asking for protection that's actually causing harm. Um, so those are some of the things that maybe have changed. Um, in addition to that, all of this is always impacted by what's going on and the different patterns of conflict that occur throughout the world. So as we see changes um, in policies and uh, in places in Central America, such as, as, such as Nicaragua, in Cuba, um, in these different places, that's gonna impact the, the, basically what folks are bringing with them when they come and arrive at our border. Wonderful. So Ermi, a question for you from Joseph. He is wondering why are there fewer resources as you move farther east along the border? That's a really good question. Um, so part of the reason why there are fewer resources is that um, certain ports of entry, for example, San Diego, Tijuana and El Paso Juarez, have historically seen um, a lot of migrants throughout the years. So there's already kind of a built up infrastructure, um, both on the US side, um, as well as in Tijuana on the Mexico side in terms of shelter networks, as well as individuals that live and work there um, on the border. But a lot of the, um, the migrants that are staying um, in the Rio Grande Valley, um, they usually are only going, before the Trump policies, they would only use that part as a passing point, but now um, they're forced to stay there and develop their own communities over there where there aren't as many resources for migrants currently. Thanks, Ermi. So Pete, we have a question for you. Um, we're, we're hearing a lot of questions about um, the political um, atmosphere we're in right now. And I think the big question is, what's the point of engaging in policy work while Trump is still in office? Well, that's a great question. Um, and the first thing that comes to mind is it would be um, extraordinarily unsatisfying to those of us who do the work um, and really feel like not true to our mission if we didn't do everything that we could to try to roll back these policies that are inflicting such cruelty uh, uh, onto asylum seekers at the border. Um, but I, I think also it allows us to, uh, to generate ideas um, for, a, for a new administration we're seeing now the context of how awful it can be. We're in a place now where we can step back as we are doing um, and imagine what, what it could be like. And so the recommendations that we're designing really will take a, will, will create a blank slate for that asylum system. We're asking ourselves questions like, what would it mean to have a truly compassionate and trauma-informed system? Um, so the work during the Trump administration allows us to see uh, the worst of how it can be, and it allows us to imagine um, how it could be in, if there was a different administration, and if we had a, a, a concerted uh, set of, of concrete policy proposals as we will have. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Pete. So Allie, I have another question for you. Um, this question is from Tracy in Washington. And um, Tracy asks that you mentioned that doing psychological evaluations in Mexico is very complicated. Um, and can you talk a little bit more about why that is? Sure. Yeah, my sister who's listening, listening virtually has challenged me to not say that's a great question. Um, but it was, it was one. So, Anyway, one of the one of the big issues with this whole psych eval, eval thing is licensing. So, for example, I'm a clinical social worker licensed in the state of Minnesota. I can't provide care, including an evaluation to say somebody in Iowa without also being licensed there. And this is also true across borders. So I, I can't technically provide a psychological evaluation to somebody in Mexico without an agreement from the Mexican government slash Department of Education. That being said, we think it, the issue is surmountable and we do have some ideas about how to move forward. Um, but you know, just recently we've heard from, um, from an attorney working on the US side that some folks in ICE detention court have um, started reporting evaluators who did an evaluation across state lines to their boards. 
Um, so we just want to be really careful about it. And this is this would be a good thing about being in partnership or conversation with other organizations who are already doing this. They've created the consent forms already. They've vetted the telehealth systems. We wouldn't want to start that up all from scratch, but maybe there's a special niche that we could provide in terms of those trauma and torture survivors who um, are asylum seekers in Remain in Mexico. I'll stop there. Thanks, Allie. Okay, Pete, last question of the evening is for you. And um, we've had several people want to know what can they do to help right now? Thank you. There's, um, and, and thanks everyone for being here. There's, there's a couple things that people can do right now. Um, I mentioned uh, earlier that we're designing this uh, training and support uh, program on secondary trauma, staff care, self-care. It's an $80,000 uh, program, um, and so contributions to that effort would be welcome. Also on the topic of contributions, the advocacy work that Andrea and uh, our other staff carry out on these issues is, is uh, financially supported by uh, individual donors from across the country. So that is also a need. But the third need is to really engage with us in active, uh, active uh, policy advocacy. You will get a, we, well, for example, we do action alerts uh, with quite a bit of frequency at times when they can make a difference when we ask our supporters to reach out to a decision maker, a member of Congress, uh, the head of the uh, Centers for Disease Control, which is an action alert that's coming up in the next couple of days. Um, and so you'll get an email tomorrow from Anna as a follow-up to this message. And in the coming days, you will receive that uh, action alert on the CDC uh, and our, pr our proposal to rescind uh, the border closing. So we ask that you consider financial contributions, but we also ask that you consider joining us in policy advocacy. It makes a difference. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. So we're gonna wrap it up here for tonight. Um, and I just wanna give one final thank you to everyone for being here with us. Survivors of torture get their lives back because of you. Healing continues because of you. And with you standing with us together, we will ensure that this healing care reaches the southern border. Good night, everyone. Be well.